Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla. I will be your host. And our guest today is David Finns, and he is a first VP at Alliant Insurance Services. Hello, David. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, Dana. Glad to have you here. So before we get started, why don't we talk a little bit about your company, what you do, who you are looking for, you know, who you're trying to reach out to, all that kind Great. of jazz. Terrific. So uh, Alliant has been around for around about 100 years now. We are a full service property and casualty insurance broker. We are licensed to transact business in all 50 states. Um, and uh, I was hired about a year and a half ago to help augment our cyber practice capabilities. Uh, I work out of our New York office, but I work with clients across the country, across all industries. Uh, my role specifically in the organization is to help our clients uh, navigate through the underwriting process to help negotiate best in class coverage for them and also to help them through a process when the claim arises, because that's always, you know, a, a nerve wracking, a challenging part of the insurance uh, process is when they're dealing with an incident and trying to uh, cooperate with the adjuster, the carrier to get their claim paid. Yeah. And I can't even imagine a cyber liability claim that would be very nerve wracking. So that's good. So you guys help people walk through the process of what to do, steps to take, who to contact, that kind of thing when there is a claim. That's right. So we, we sort of serve as their advocate. Now we do not go to court or arbitration on their behalf. Our goal is to try to resolve any disputes with the carrier around coverage without having to go to those extremes. Um, obviously, we have relationships with all of the insurance carriers that we place business with. And so our job is to help the insured, that's the policyholder, understand the process, respond to information requests from the insurance adjuster, and you know to line up all the service providers they need uh, as part of the incident response. Okay. So who would be a good group of people to work for, that, to work with you, like to offer your product? So, you know, we have relationships across, you know, all of the cybersecurity vendors that you see as part of the incident response process, the breach coach or privacy council, as they're called, the forensics investigators, um, the uh, public relations firms, you name it. Uh, obviously, we're going to work with the ones that the insurers are going to approve. You know, they each have their preferred panel. But if a client were to come to us and say, hey, we've got this great law firm we have a relationship with, we'd like to use them. Well, then obviously we would try to get them approved by the underwriters and have them added to their policy. Yeah. And I'm sure there's probably like a checklist of things that you have to check on them to make sure that they're doing to make sure that they there's due diligence. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that that's good. And I think that, um, you know, it seems like cyber liability insurance is something that people are starting to hear. I know you, you are, you're well-versed in this, but um, we're going to get into some specific questions about that, but specific to your company, why would why would it be beneficial for somebody to reach out to you? So, you know, most larger insurance brokers do have a cyber practice. And, you know, it's important to, to understand that when you are engaging an insurance broker, you are, you know, signing up for a team of people that are going to work with you. Uh, I came from one of the big three insurance brokers in the industry. I spent a good amount of time there. Uh, what I like about Alliant is that we're large enough to be able to provide uh, resources to our clients and different industry verticals, different specializations around the types of products that they need, but we're also small enough to be able to spoil them rotten with attention, to put it bluntly. Uh, you know, I, if, I, if I have an account uh, that, you know, maybe in the eyes of a larger uh, insurer might be, insurance broker might be considered a medium-sized account, um, they're going to get the white glove treatment from us. You know, they're important to us and uh, we're going we're going to treat them with the attention that uh, that they deserve. And that includes going through their policy, making sure that they have the most up-to-date coverage enhancements uh, because the threat environment, as you know, Dana, is always changing with cyber. And so the insurance product continues to evolve to respond to it. And we want to make sure uh, that our client's coverage keeps pace uh, with the changes in the threat environment that they're facing. Well, that's really huge that you guys do that because, you know, when something happens, I always say nothing is a big deal until something happens. And when it happens, it is going to be a very big deal. And to have that hand holding and that white glove treatment, that is a huge thing that I'm sure people would really appreciate knowing ahead of time when they're comparing 
different companies and not necessarily just going for the cheapest one or, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, making sure that when something does happen, which chances are, unfortunately, it might, that they're going to be in good hands. So that's fantastic. All right, great. Well, is there anything else you want to throw out there before we dive into our topic? No, again, we're gonna we're gonna go through for uh, your audience now. Basically, what cyber insurance is and why people need it, and yep. I'll be happy to answer any questions people may have. And at the end, we can give them my contact information if they'd like to reach out. So let's get started. That's perfect. And this is a really good topic because we haven't talked about this uh, very much, and I think that there may be some you know things that people don't really know clearly. So hopefully, by the end of this, they'll be a little bit uh, have a little bit more savvy on the cyber insurance world. All right, so our first question is, what does cyber insurance cover exactly? Right, so there's not a lot of standardization in the wording from one insurance carrier to another. They use different vocabulary to describe much the same thing. But essentially what cyber insurance is designed to do is to cover the out-of-pocket costs, or as we call them, the first party costs, as well as the cost of defending and potentially settling or having a judgment on a claim from a third party when there is a compromise to someone's data network or the network that somebody depends upon to do business. Because as you know, a lot of companies are using managed service providers or other IT vendors. And when they go down, then our client can't operate and do business. So, you know, there's there's extensions of the coverage that pick up those types of scenarios as well. That's good. That sounds very important. All right, so why do you think many small and mid-sized businesses still haven't purchased the coverage? So this is you know, a, an area that there's a lot of potential for growth in the industry, in, in the cyber insurance product, right? Uh, at the last statistic I heard was about a year and a half, two years ago, that seven out of 10 small businesses were still not buying the coverage. And there's reasons for that. Um, some might believe that they're not a likely target of a cyber attack, as I'm sure you know, no one uh, is exempt, no one is immune from this epidemic of ransomware and what have you. Uh, some of them may believe that their defenses are sufficient and that they can withstand an attack. And as we all know, nobody's system is foolproof. Uh, but the biggest reason that I run into when I speak to folks is that they believe that cyber insurance doesn't pay on claims. And unfortunately, there's been some misinformation out there in the press because what happens is a company doesn't have cyber insurance or doesn't have enough coverage or the right type of coverage and they try to fit a square peg into a round hole by trying to wedge that claim into another type of insurance policy and when the claim gets denied and they lose in court then the headline reads you know policyholder loses or insurance company prevails on mm -hmm. cyber claim but nobody reads past the headline to understand that it was a policy that was never designed for that purpose. And that's really an argument for having dedicated cyber coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there as far as exactly what it does cover, what it doesn't cover. Is it worth the money? You know, the big thing too is these small and medium sized businesses knowing that yes, they are a target because you're absolutely right. They do not think that their information is valuable enough that anybody really would want to want to bother with them. And that's not true. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the conventional wisdom around cyber insurance was that it was to respond to data breaches, right? So if you're not a large retailer or a healthcare organization or a bank, you might think, well, I don't have a lot of consumer data. It's not really an issue for me. But people have to stop and think, well, what would be the cost to us if our network went down and we weren't able to fulfill orders or if our you know, data was held for, for ransom and it was encrypted and we were not able to, to get at it without having to pay for the decryption key. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, cyber crime is picking up social engineering. So misdirected invoice, you know, payments, uh, uh, ACH wire transfer instructions that are fraudulent. There's all types of exposures uh, that have nothing to do with whether you have large quantities of data that really uh, the, the coverage is designed to respond to and and to enable the policyholder to to make themselves whole. So that's a good question you just brought up about the uh, the you know the fake invoices getting paid and money getting wired out. So is that something that would be covered under the general liability insurance policy of a company, or is that something that specifically because it's going over the internet, it's a cyber, it's covered by the cyber policy? So this is where it gets to be a little bit of a hodgepodge because a fraudulent transfer of funds from a bank would likely be covered under a company's crime or fidelity policy, whereas a social engineering scheme where basically somebody 
uh, uh, sends you a fraudulent email and says, okay, I need, you know, I need you to, to redirect the coffee vendors uh, payment to uh, uh, this account number. Mm -hmm. uh, and, don't, and don't bother calling me because I'm going to be in the middle of an important meeting, but this needs to be done today or we're going to have no coffee and everybody <laughs> going to a halt, right? That sort of thing uh, where, where you're at that point uh, being fished and sending the payment elsewhere, that could be picked up under a crime or cyber policy. But when it's the mirror image of that and somebody else misdirects a payment that you are waiting for, that sort of invoice manipulation is really an enhancement that you have to negotiate onto a cyber policy because otherwise you end up with a bad receivable on your books because you're not able to collect because right. your customer says, I already made this payment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that just happened uh, to a Connecticut um, company in Hartford that was doing business with a company in Arizona. Somebody got in the system, made an invoice that looked very similar to everything they had seen. So when the person who paid it didn't question it at all, sent it off and then, um, you know, the person that, that did, you know, they're like, we already paid it. Exactly. What you just said, we already paid this. We're not paying you again because it went to China or wherever it went to. So, and that's, that's scary stuff. When, what are you going to do? Get that money back. So, all right. Our next question. What are the factors that underwriters consider when they are evaluating a risk? Right. So, you know, the underwriting process has gotten a lot more stringent over the past year or two, understandably so because of all the claims that they have been paying out on with ransomware. And so, you know, it comes back to the three factors everybody talks about in cyber risk, right? It's technology, it's process, and it's people, right? So obviously they want to see the basic controls, the blocking and tackling, as they call it in place, right? They want to see multi-factor authentication. They want to see endpoint detection and response. They want to see how you manage uh, uh, privileges, you know, ad admin privileges and what have you. Do you do phishing training for your employees? And the larger the organization and the more sensitive the data that they're handling, the more sophisticated they're going to expect those controls to be, right? I mean, if you're a you know $20 million a year uh, termite control company, you're not necessarily going to have the same controls in place as JP Morgan Chase. And right. the, the underwriters understand this, but commensurate with the risk, they do want to see that you're, you know, nurturing a, a culture of cyber hygiene. And that this is top of mind, that you have an incident response plan, that you have uh, backups for your data that are air gap, that are off the network and are safe, et cetera. So these are things that we're not a cybersecurity vendor, but we help prepare our clients by getting them to think about the controls that they need and connecting them with service providers who can help them put those controls in place. You know, what's another good thing about this is that typically the business owner is going to have to ask their MSP or their MSSP for, are you guys doing this? Are we doing this? So it's good to find out, you know, what what their answers are, because if there's, oh, we don't really get involved in that or, oh, we don't really mm -hmm. do that. You know, that's when you realize you might not have the right, um, you know, MSSP or MSP in place. So those are good things to check off the list when you're asking those questions. Yeah, I mean, if there's any silver lining in the underwriting process becoming much uh, more stringent over the past few years, as I said, it's the fact that we can now use that process as a gut check so that companies can think about what additional controls they may wish to put in place. And ideally, that's what you want to do. I mean, you wouldn't have, uh, uh, you wouldn't expect an insurance company to write you property coverage if you didn't have sprinkler systems and you didn't conduct fire drills for your employees. So this is the equivalent of that. We're really expecting at this point that the policyholder, the insured, will begin to put the controls in that the underwriters want to see so that apart from the fact that it keeps them safe, it allows them to present themselves as a more attractive risk. Mm -hmm. And I always use that fire, uh, you know, the fire drills, because when you're a kid and we all know exactly what to do when we were a kid in school, if there was a you know fire drill, but you know, if there was a cyber attack, would, would everybody or anybody know what to do? That's uh, not usually as, you know, ready as the fire drill was. Okay. What is the role of the broker in cyber insurance process? Right. So as I mentioned at the outset of our discussion, right, I, I, my personal role is threefold here, right? Uh, one is to educate our clients about the threat environment, about the insurance marketplace, what product is available to them, what the different coverages are that are included in the policy, to get them thinking about the controls that they need, putting them in touch with the vendors, that they need to, to get those controls in place and helping them prepare what we call the underwriting submission, which is really the application for the coverage. Um, obviously that requires knowing the market, knowing you know if I've got 
a mid-sized retailer or a small manufacturer or whatever, you know, who's the best match for them in the, you know, among the insurance companies that underwrite this coverage, who am I going to send this risk to? And then going through the quotes with them, the term proposal, as we call it, so that they can see what their options are. You know, this one is has a more attractive premium, but they have a higher what we call retention, which functions like a deductible. Uh, you know, this one is sublimiting their ransomware coverage. This one isn't. This one will replace bricked hardware. This one won't. And help them decide what's the best option for them. And then negotiating the terms of the policy, getting the best policy wording we can for them. And then ultimately, if God forbid they do have a claim, right, helping them navigate through the claims process. Well, that sounds like a very, very important role. So that it, it puts a lot, a lot of value in that. You're going to go through all those different things initially because uh, I don't think a lot of insurance agents are necessarily doing that when they're going over. Because some of the, I hate to say this, but some of the insurance agents that are now offering cyber liability, they don't really understand it themselves. So they try to, you know, kind of skim over some things. And I know this from experience. And um, But you would go in there and really, okay, this is going to cover this. This is not going to cover this. This scenario is not going to be covered. This scenario is going to be covered. And that's really good stuff, too, to do in addition to, you know, being there when there is going to be a good claim. So that's great. Yeah. It's difficult to do this as a generalist, right? I mean, you know, we have property and casualty brokers in the company and they're very good at what they do, uh, mm -hmm. but we are investing in having more dedicated cyber resources, both on the broking side and myself on the claims and coverage side, uh, because we need to give our clients that level of specialization. The folks that they're dealing with on the insurer side, they have dedicated full-time cyber resources. And so the brokers need to offer the same. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. OK, so what should companies do to prepare to buy cyber insurance for the first time? Right. So as I mentioned, right, there are controls that the underwriters are looking for. Some of them are more technology driven and some are more about process and people. Uh, we actually have a checklist, if you will. This is a composite of all the questions that the underwriters are asking on their applications. And what we did was we've prioritized them in terms of near medium and long-term objectives so that our clients can kind of focus their time and resources on what's going to move the needle the most for them. You know, if they're looking to buy the coverage because a contract requires it or they're a startup firm or they're being spun off from another company and they need to go out and buy this coverage for the first time, it's kind of like, here's the things you need to focus on right now. And then there's some other priorities that we can look at for say year two. Mm -hmm. um, we can make that uh, available to your audience so that they can go through that and uh, have you know this as a guide for them. Because again, the, the questions that we're asking about here, these are the things that the underwriters want to see. And to the extent that either they're in-house IT or if they have a virtual CISO or somebody else that's not able to get them these services, we can connect them with folks who you know can help them become uh, more insurable and present themselves as a better person. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, the one good thing too about the insurance companies requiring these steps, multi-factor authentication, you know, the training, incident response plan. The good thing about that is it's now it's forcing the hand that people actually start doing something because before they would say, well, I'm just going to buy insurance if, if they did and not worry about anything. And you, you can't do that. You know, you can't just buy fire insurance and say, well, leave the stove on. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's going to be covered, you know by the insurance company. So that's good because I always talk about how we need to get this into part of our whole just mindset of what we do when we're online is the cybersecurity with all the different employees and even our family members at home. So that's good that they're requiring some of these things. That makes me happy. Yeah, we, we never want our clients to choose insurance over security, right? As a risk advisor, we want them to get the best controls that they can in place and then recognizing that you can never 100% insure away the risk at that point, transfer what portion yeah. you can never be certain about to the insurance policy, but you know, not to skimp on their security because that the, the, the best outcome of a claim is not to have one in the first place. Right, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> best thing is to not have to use the insurance. Exactly. Okay, so to wrap this up, this was excellent information. So how can people get in touch with you? Great, so folks can DM me on LinkedIn or they can email me at david.fins at alliant.com. And Dana, I actually have a special offer for your audience today. Yay. Which is that if they contact me, I can offer them a free copy 
of my little booklet. This is written in plain English. It's not written in cyber geek language. And this is all about what small and mid-sized businesses need to know about cyber insurance. I'll even cover shipping and handling. I just need an address to send them to, and uh, we'll be happy to get that out to them. Perfect. So that's great. So if anybody wants a copy of that, you know, reach out to David and he will get that for you. Right. All right. Well, that sounds great. So thank you so much for your time and all this great information. I appreciate it. And I'm sure the audience does too. So thank you, David. Great. Thanks for having me on, Dana. Take care. You're very welcome. And thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you around the next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.